So this is the semantics of advanced data types. And um, the remember, there are the four lectures. And the course outline has this structure where we talk about syntax of semantics of ADTs and nested types. And that's what we did yesterday. And today we're gonna to talk about syntax and semantics of GADTs. So hopefully you had a little bit of time to think about the um, ADTs and nested types um, from yesterday. Uh, lectures three and four are coming up. So um, like I said, um, we looked at ADTs and nested types. And what we saw is that the difference between ADTs and nested types really has to do with the allowable kinds of types um, of the constructors for these data types. So with ADTs, um, you really are only ever allowed to use the instance of the data type that you're trying to construct in the types of the constructors. And we saw that we relaxed that a little bit for nested types and just um, allowed different instances of the data type we're defining to be in the domains of the constructors. So not in the codomains, but just in the domains of the constructors. So today we're gonna to relax that even further and talk when we start talking about the syntax of, and semantics of GADTs, which is right now, okay? So what is a GADT? Well, um, from a Haskell programmer's point of view, I mean, they might tell you something about, um, about syntax in terms of Haskell, but the way that I would describe it is I would say, well, the shape of a GADT can depend on the data it contains. So here's what I mean. So if I'm thinking about the data constructors for some GADT type, and we'll have an example um, just in a minute, then both the input types to the constructor and the return type can, be, um, can involve different instances of the data type than the one being defined. So remember that for nested types, you could only in, have constructors that involved different instances of the data type being defined in the inputs to the constructors. But now we're allowing that in the outputs of the constructors as well. Okay. And of course, if you've got a fancier type, a more general type, that's going to mean that you're able to encode some more sophisticated properties. So let me show you an example of a GADT, and um, I can kind of see what I mean by that. So let's have a GADT of sequences. So I'm going to have two constructors, because as I told you, all the data types in this talk <laughs> seem to have two constructors. Okay, that's not true. Um, but I have one that makes constant sequences. So you give me an A thing and I'll make a sequence of A's. And this is for any A. But then I have this other constructor S pair. So it's not, I called it something other than pair because pair is already taken. So this takes a sequence of A's and a sequence of B's and makes a sequence of A cross B's. So notice that here I have an instance um, different from seek A, right? So I don't know what exactly which instance I'm trying to make, but here I've got here const will make seek of any type, but s pair will only make seek of types that are pairs. Okay, and that's different from what we had for nested types yesterday. Always the return type of a constructor was seek a for some variable a or seek b or seek c or whatever. Okay, so again, the important thing here is that this constructor s pair, it only constructs um, sequences of pairs. Okay. Here's another example. I could have um, a data type of expressions. And here, okay, um, here's where I actually went wild with the constructor. So now I've got six of them just to show that I can, I guess. So variable, I have, um, they're parameterized over A and B where A is the type of variables and B is the type of coefficients. So an expression a, B is, well, if you give me an A thing, I can make a ver um, an expression of A, B, because I've got variables of type A, so I can make expressions A, B. Um, I can make um, expressions that take an int and give me variables of type A at, with integer coefficients. I can do the same thing for float. Here, um, I can take the product of two expressions, A, B, and get a new expression, A, B. Here, if I'm doing an I scalar mult, so I'm thinking of scalar multiplication here. If you give me an expression AB and I have and an int, then remember I'm thinking that I have variables um, of type A and coefficients of type B, then that's going to give me an expression AB, okay? Because the only two base types, the only kinds of coefficients I have are ints and floats. So 
If B was int, I'd have int, and if B was float, I'd have float. But if I'm thinking about float scalar multiplication, if you give me um, an expression a b, remember b can be int or float, and a float coefficient, then I definitely get um, an expression over a and float. So the idea here is um, basically that I can code up fancier, um, fancier kinds of constraints using these data types. And um, actually, I need to just change. I need to move something around on my screen a little bit so that I can see what I'm showing you, except I can't see it. I can't move it. <laughs> All right, I can't see the bottom of my screen, but I guess you can. Not, can you? Can you see the last thing on the screen? Can something yes, Jean, we can see it. Can or cannot? Oh, we can see it. I can, I can, yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, that's great. It's, I can't, but- Note that okay. icons to Fcons, isn't it? Note that icons to Fcons and Fc. FC multi again construct, right? That's, I can yeah. see that. Okay, that's perfect. I can't see it, but if you can see it, that's all that matters. Okay, so um, so the idea here is that certain constructors can only make um, expressions of certain shapes. Similarly, here, S pair can only make um, sequences with types that have certain shapes. Okay, so again, that's different from what we have with nested types. So um, I claim that GADTs aren't functorial, or maybe I should say they aren't obviously functorial. Okay, so if they were, then remember that um, they would have kind of shape preserving data changing map functions, right? That's how all of our maps worked yesterday. So what would the map for seek look like? Well, you would give it a function from A to B and a sequence of A's and it should make a sequence of B's. So let's see how that would look. Well, if I'm thinking about the clause for const, so remember I've got the two constructors, const and, um, and S pair. Well, if I'm thinking about um, const, then if you gave me a const of, of x and um, x has type a, and this is this const x here has type uh, seek a, and I want to map this function from a to b over it, then I can do that because if I apply um, f to x, I get a b thing, and then I have const b, and that's a sequence of b, so everything's really good. All right, but what about this s pair clause? So my function, remember S pair makes sequences of pairs. So the, the function that I'm trying to map should take pairs to some other type. All right, well, if I try to map a function that takes pairs to another type across an S pair thing, well, I should get an S pair thing, right? Because remember, we're supposed to kind of preserve the shape and maybe change the data. So I should get an S pair thing. But S pair of what? I have no idea. Well, what if the return type of f isn't a pair, isn't a pair type? Ooh, well, I don't know what to do because s pair only makes sequences of pair types. Or what if it is a pair type, but the function that I'm trying to map isn't a pair of functions? So there's something up, right? There's something a little bit wrong here. Um, I, I just, I can't define a map, at least not in the obvious way. Okay, and in a similar way, if I look, if I'm just going to go back, if I look at the clauses of this expert type, the ones that are kind of um, specific are this I const, right, because it returns not expert AB, but expert A int, um, and this one F const, because it returns expert A float, and this uh, float scalar multiplication, because again, it returns expert A float. The other ones return expert AB, expert AB, expert AB, so they won't cause a problem for the map. But those three will cause a problem for the map for expert in, in exactly the same way. So what we've just sort of seen is that GADTs don't support map functions kind of in this kind of obvious kind of container sense that we talked about yesterday. So how are we going to give initial algebra semantics to GADTs, right? Because we want our GADTs to be data types in the sense that ADTs are data types and nested types are data types. GADTs just generalize those. So we should have the same kind of semantics, the same, same kind of initial algebra semantics. And of course we want an initial algebra semantics because there are things, there's like programming stuff that we get from that semantics, right? Like um, we get pattern matching on the constructors and folds and, um, and the maps, and we want those things for our data types. Okay, so one thing you might be thinking right now is, 
well, what if I don't really care about that? I mean, what if I'm, I want to say, you know, if I have algebraic data types, I definitely want a map and I want all the things I get from um, initial algebra semantics. And for nested types, definitely want that. But for GADTs, mm, I'm happy to have something else. Well, suppose now you want to have a list of sequences in your language. You can't have a map for that because this, the data type seek doesn't have a map. So like in a way, the GADTs kind of pollute the rest of the language in that sense. Okay, so what I'm interested in here is how do I give an initial algebra semantics to GADTs? So let's have a look. Okay, so it turns out that there are two ways to recover um, the functoriality so that we can take initial algebras, right? Um, and both of them can be described in terms of left can extensions. So, um, there's a quick question in the chat. If, yep. If you want to try to address it. Um, sure. uh, Matthias asked if you wanted to do induction on, on statics on the type expert A int, how would you filter out the constructors and say, these don't apply because it's a float and not an int? Um, I don't really understand the question. How, what do you mean? How would I filter them out? I don't really understand that. I'm stating it so like uh, only some of the rules produce something of type int. Mm -hmm. uh, if I want to figure out uh, these are all the rules that produce int and these are mm -hmm. all the rules that produce float and mm -hmm. only hooked on the ones that produce int, how can I like decide? Uh, the... Okay, so I don't know how to induct um, over an arbitrary GADT because that is something that we'll talk about in the fourth lecture when we talk about parametricity for GADTs, okay? So um, this is kind of exactly where I'm trying to head and induction can be thought of as unary parametricity. So I don't think in general, there's gonna be a way to, um, to do that. And if you, that sounds to me like some kind of refinement, like some kind of like, if I have an induction principle on a whole type, which I'm not even sure I have, um, and I look at some refinement of that, then do I have an induction principle? on that refinement. And I don't know the answers to those questions. That's not something I've, I've worked on. I don't know if that, whoever asked that, I don't know if that answered your question. I mean, it's kind yeah, of non thanks. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so um, Daniel, are there other questions? That's it for now. Okay, thanks. Okay, all right. So um, here we are. So, like I said, there are two ways to recover functoriality, and they can both be described in terms of left can extensions. So, I'm going to um, tell you what a left can extension is. First, I'm going to try and tell you intuitively. Then, I'm going to give you a formal definition. And I will be very impressed if someone can digest this um, entire definition and be able to work with it um, in real time. So, what I'm going to do is kind of highlight the salient point, the really important point, and show you what it has to do with the GADTs. Okay. So, um, to really learn about, you know, left-hand extensions, it would take some time, but um, that's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm just trying to show you how these things work so that you can um, maybe think about them a little bit more, ask questions, um, learn about them on your own a little bit. Okay, so here's, here's what a left-hand extension does. If you have a functor going from a category C to a category D, and another functor going from the same category C to a different category E, then the left can extension, which we write like this, so it's the left can extension of F along K, what it does is it gives you kind of a best functorial approximation to F that factors through K. So F is already a functor. So I'm not looking for a best functorial approximation to F, I'm looking for a best one that factors through K. All right, so, what does that mean? So what I want is the smallest functor. That's what I mean by best. The smallest functor, and I'll tell you what that means more precisely in just a minute. We're kind of like, you know, digging down a little bit at a time. It should be the smallest functor that is going to extend the image of K from E to D and agrees um, with and so that, like this left can extension after K should agree with F on C on this common domain. 
and not agree like on the nose, but agree in the sense that there's a natural transformation going from F to this composition. Let me draw you a picture. <laughs> it might be a little bit easier to see. Is it like a projection of some kind? Can we think of it as, as first approximation as a projection of some sort uh, from, from, from F to uh, LAN, LAN FK? Is this like well, a... Is that, is that a reason? I wouldn't think of it as a projection. I would think of it as a, I think of it as a functorial completion. Okay. Um, but maybe there's a way to think of it as a projection that I'm not aware of. So, okay. so the idea is I've got F and I've got K and I want to, I mean, F is already a functor, but it doesn't necessarily factor through K. So what I want to do is find another functor so that F is, K followed by that other functor, but again, not exactly, just sort of up to natural transformation. So again, still not a formal definition. I'm gonna have the formal definition on the next slide, um, but that's the idea. So the idea is that you want to somehow extend um, K with a functor and have it agree with F. And I promise this has something to do with GADTs. <laughs> that may not be obvious. So here's a formal definition. Um, all it's saying is if you have F and K, then the left can extension of F along K, which is what we write like this, is exactly the thing in the, in the previous diagram. And the idea, I'm gonna go back. The idea is that um, I should have a natural transformation going from F to K followed by um, land KF. And it should be, this should be best in the sense that if I had another one, so if I had a functor G and there were a natural transformation going from F to K followed by G, then I could kind of catch up to myself using another natural transformation delta. So that's what I mean by smallest. Um, okay, so it's kind of a hard definition to get your mind around, but I'm going to show you um, the important thing for us today. Okay, so what it, what it says is that if you had um, let me go back again. If you had this, um, this you have this eta, so the can't, left can extension comes with this eta. And if you had a gamma going from F to K followed by G, then there's a unique delta going from the left can extension to G so that the diagram commutes. So what that means is that there's a natural isomorphism of, there's an, an isomorphism of natural transformation. So gamma went from F to G compose K, this kind of thing purporting to be the left can extension. And what we're saying by saying that the left can extension is the smallest one and that there's a unique um, delta that goes um, from land KF to G such that that diagram commutes. What we're saying is that if you give me this gamma, I can give you this delta and vice versa. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the gammas and the deltas. And that's all I've written here. So this is the important property. This is the thing we're gonna use, okay? So um, again, I, like I said, I would be pretty impressed if somebody could digest all of the definition all at once, but this is the important property that we're gonna use. There's an isomorphism between natural transformations going between the functor F and the functor G compose K and um, natural transformations going from this functor that is the left can extension to, a, to the functor G. So if suppose we were to add to our type system a type constructor that was just the syntactic reflection of this left can extension. So it had like um, introduction rules and elimination rules that um, corresponded to just um, exactly um, this kind of definition that I've just given then I claim that we could use that syntactic reflection of this isomorphism to rewrite the syntax of our GADTs, okay? So what that would give is a, like a best approximation functorial completion to the GADT syntax. And what that's gonna let us do is write our GADTs as fixed points in the same way we wrote our nested types as fixed points. Okay, so in other words, functorial, this kind of functorial completion using the left can extension, the LAN, is gonna let us model GADTs as fixed points of higher order functors. So let me show you how that works. Daniel, are there questions right now? 
Yes, uh, a couple of questions from okay. the chat. Um, one is, is the left hand extension um, the initial object in some functor category? category? Of extensions, a category of can extensions, yeah. Um, and then does it always exist, uh, exist up to isomorphism? It doesn't, um, you have to be in, um, you have to have, there are certain conditions on categories um, that you need in, in order for them to exist. And finally, is these, this isomorphism of natural transformations, is that um, coming from an adjunction? Um, there is an adjunction, yes. And okay, there's one more. Um, is the bestness of this approximation the thing that will ensure that applying the same technique to ADTs will give the old functor interpretation? Yes. Yes, indeed. So what we're doing is we're going to show that um, GADTs have exactly the same kind of in, um, initial algebra semantics that nested types at right high, the, um, uh, they're going to be fixed points of higher order functors. And when you specialize this down to nested types and ADTs, you will get, you will recover exactly what we saw last time. So that was it for now? Yeah, that's it. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let me show you how this works, okay? So remember our seek data type, it had constants and it had pairs. Well, I don't have to do anything to rewrite the, um, the type of const because that's already, basically it already has a variable. It's like seek of A for any old A. But S pair had this type, it said, um, oops, those shouldn't be slanted, but anyway, um, ignore, the, ignore the font error. Um, it, should, it said, if I give me a seek a and a seek B, then I'll give you a seek of A cross B. So here, the G is seek. The K of AB is A cross B. And F is, um, F of AB is seek A cross seek B. So what I want to do is look at the left can extension along K of F and we know that there is this correspondence from F goes to G compose K, which is what the type of our constructor S pair looked like, right? Because it said seek A, F was seek A cross seek B, G is seek, and then K was A cross B. And I know that there's a correspondence between that and um, natural transformations here. So now I can take this land, apply it to A and get a G of A for any old A, okay? So now my constructors have types that look very much like nested, nested type constructors, right? I mean, they're not because I've got this LAN when I didn't need that for the nested types, but I definitely am going into some variable instance. So now at least I can write my, um, my data type. I can interpret it as the fixed point of the higher order functor. This is just what we did yesterday with the nested types, which higher order functor? Well, you give me a functor and a piece of data and um, I just have the X here for this input to const. And what kind of input do I need to use S pair? Well, this land thing. So now I just have something that's very similar to what I had before for the nested types, except that I have to use lands, whereas for nested types, I didn't need to use them. Okay. Similarly, I can rewrite my expert data type. So remember the problematic constructors were I const, F const, and F, S, F scalar multiplication. And I can just rewrite each one of those. Um, I can rewrite I const as, so in here, um, I have lambda A, B, and then A int. That's the, um, the way that I can think about this, um, this functor, this instance of expert. And the F is just, will you give me A and B and I'll give you int, and now I can make an X for AB. And similarly, um, I guess for F const, I can do exactly the same thing, except that now instead of int, I've got float. And for the scalar multiplication, I have the same thing. Here's the original type. Um, oh, I guess I, oh, I did write it here. So here's the original type. And now I've got the left can extension of lambda a, b, a comma float. That's the instance of expert I'm using here. And 
um, the F is something that takes an expert AB and a float. So that's what I've got here. And now I can just make an expert AB. So if I do all of that, then I can interpret um, expert um, as the least fixed point of the functor that's on the screen, that big old long crazy thing. So just exactly what we did before. Uh, two questions from the chat. Okay. Um, do all GADTs satisfy the appropriate requirements for there to be a left can extension? No, not not in. Um, I'm talking right now just about what's happening in set, and no, not all of them do. And someone asked how to implement LAN with GADTs. I think that's. I guess they're asking, like how you would implement LAN and ACTA as a GADT. Yeah. As possible. Um. So you can, it would involve an equality type, right? And then of course there's the tricky issue of what equality, what equality do you mean? Um, yes, I didn't write um, any Agda code to do this, but um, actually Daniel, you can probably, uh, may you might be able to speak a lot to this. Can you say something? Um, yeah, I can take it in the chat though. Okay, all right. Um, that's fair. But yeah, so you you could write this using the equality type, but then you'd have to um, think about what equality you, you meant. Okay. And that's it for now. Okay, thanks. All right. So, um, so what we want to do is we want to um, kind of talk about these left can extensions, or in other words, if I think about the left can extension as doing a functorial completion, then I want to think about completion options. So um, it's not immediately clear that there's only one choice. Like I can think of two choices. So at the level of objects, like we were just kind of looking at what happens at the level of objects. And at the level of objects, this left can extension stuff is going to give you at least the objects you expect to have. OK. So, um, so that's really good. But what about morphisms? What about natural transformations, right? I mean, if I'm thinking about a GADT as a data type, a data type is determined not only by the data, but also by the, you know, the functions it supports or the, the morphisms in the category. Okay, so what about the morphisms here? Okay, so I claim that there are two obvious choices. And one of them is to you to look at your category C in which you were interpreting types and um, to look at that as a discrete category. So what I mean by a discrete category is that you have no morphisms other than identity morphisms, right? Those are ones you absolutely have to have and that's all you have, okay? But um, because I, um, I'm, there are these uh, conditions on the categories that I um, alighted yesterday and I'm going to continue to elide them. What I, instead of using the whole category C discreetly, what I'd like to do is just look at a discrete category. I call it I because it should be just the interpretations of the types in C. So for some technical reasons, I don't just wanna look at the category discrete C. I wanna look at this category just of the interpretations of types, okay? But if you want, you can think of I as discrete C. I mean, for, the, for our purposes today, that will be fine. So that's one choice. So then my left can extension diagram has this, this category here is some a power of I. This one is just I. This one is, again, some power of I. This M represents the number of arguments that F takes. And this N represents the number of arguments that the GADT itself takes. Okay. And then here I, I can have a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of functors, not just one, but I can have a whole bunch. So this is one option. I can basically compute my left can extensions in a discrete category with respect to a discrete category. Another option is I can use the full category C with all the morphisms that it has. Then my, my left can extension looks exactly the same, except that instead of I everywhere, now I've got Cs. And what we want to do is just look at each of these choices in turn. So I'm, I'm going to start sorry. with... Could, yeah. could you please uh, re repeat again? M and N starts for number of what exactly? Okay, so in the GADT, um, M is going to correspond to the number of constructors that I have. It's the, okay. Um, 
I can, let's see, is that true? It's also the arity of F. So I can think of it as the arity of F if I want. And N I can think of as um, the number of type arguments that the GADT is gonna take. Yeah, thanks. Okay. You mean dis distinct, distinct type arguments? Distinct Pardon type. Me? You mean distinct type arguments, right? So if a repeated one will not be considered. I don't know what it would mean to have a GADT that took, um, well, I mean, it's a number of, yeah. So what would it mean to say I have a, I have a sequence of A's and A's? I mean, or yeah, a, yeah, fair enough, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know what that would mean exactly. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Sorry about that. No, 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 no problem. Okay, so, um, so we're gonna look at the discrete ones and then we're gonna look at the non-discrete ones. We're gonna warm up with the discrete ones. So I'm gonna make some simplifying assumptions. So I'm going to notice that all of the type arguments to the GADT are, they're all treated the same. And all of the GADT's data constructors, they're just treated the same, just like we treated all of the ADT data constructors the same, like list, you know, treat nil and cons exactly the same. I mean, they have different types, but you handle them the same way. And similarly for our nested types, well, it's the same for the GADTs. So what that means is I'm going to assume for the purposes of the rest of the discussion that the GADT of interest takes one type argument, so M is one, and it ha um, has one data constructor, so N is one. So in other words, what I'm saying is I'm just gonna look at this kind of super simplified GADT, right? This is what I'm gonna look at. So I've got one constructor, I take G takes one, arg one type argument. I have one constructor. So the type of the constructor is f of a to g of k a for some f and k. Okay. So if you have this, then the interpretation of your GADT will be, okay, so it'll be the least fixed point of the functor h, which sends j to this left-hand extension. So, um, I'm going to have some simplifying assumptions as we, as we go on. In the discrete case, I don't have to worry about this, but in general, you should think of K as not containing any Js and F can contain some Js. So like, for example, the, um, the S pair constructor for seek definitely um, included some seeks, right? It was seek, the type was seek of A cross seek of, or to seek of B goes to seek of A cross B. But I didn't have something like seek of seek of something in the return type. And so I, I am going to want to restrict to not having that. Okay, I'm not gonna have that kind of nesting in the return type. So if I, ha if I have one of these super simplified GADTs, which is only simplified in notation, right? It's not simplified in any other sense, right? Um, I mean, I, I'm gonna handle more arguments to G and more constructors in exactly the same way is just basically going to become a notational nightmare. So I'm going to simplify for the purposes of the um, exposition. But what I would do is I would see G as the least fixed point of this functor where the functor involves a left can extension. So in, in some sense you could say, all right, well, hey, I'm done now. But we might want to know how do we compute these left hand extensions? How do we compute the semantics of a GADT, right? This is just kind of an abstract description. How do I actually compute this? So that's what I want to talk about now. Okay, so it turns out that under the exact same conditions that you need to compute the fixed points of functors, like for ADTs and nested types, you can actually compute left hand extensions using a well-known co-limit formula. So under some conditions, which are exactly the ones I elided before, the left can extension of F along K can be computed as this co-limit. All right, well, um, I'm gonna pare this down again, kind of show you how you can think about this in terms of something that you know, at least in term, if we're thinking about semantics in set but this is what it is in general. So what do I do? I look at all the A's in, oh, what's the C0 thing? Well, C is my category and 
C0 is a set of objects from which all the other objects in the category can be generated by colimits. And how do I know that exists? It's because it's one of the conditions on, on my category. And actually, again, you need this in, in the um, ADT and the nested types case too. That was one of the conditions that I lighted. Okay. And you look at functions going um, out of that object and into the object that you want to apply the left can extension to. So you look at pairs like that. And um, what are you taking the colimit of? It's the functor that um, the F, the kind of like the arguments to the constructors evaluated at this object A. Okay, so that looks a little bit crazy, but, but here's the idea. The idea is that in nice categories, this really big thing that is a left can extension can actually be computed as a pretty small co-limit, okay? So it can be computed as a colimit over a pretty small set of support. So that's the, um, the key point here. So if you're in a sufficiently nice category, you have a way to compute this left can extension, which in general is very large, but because the categories have these particular properties that you actually need even to take fixed points. So you're not imposing any more categories to be able to, or any more conditions on your category to be able to compute the left can extension. Um, you can compute the left can extension kind of reasonably. Your small set of support is your C0, is it? It is. Right. And again, I haven't exactly told you what all of that is, except that it's some set of objects from which all the other ones can be generated by co-limits. OK, so in set, this we know that the left can extension is this, um, if we're looking at the, the discrete GADT interpretations, it's this. Um, co-limit, where now the A's are coming from my interpreting category, and my F is going from K, A to X, just as before, and I'm looking at F of A. And I can actually compute this as a union of F of A indexed by exactly this same indexing pairs, but modded out by an equivalence relation. So instead, I have a really um, concrete way to compute this. So the, the elements of the union here, they're triples, right? Give me an I, give me an F, and give me a piece of data of type FA. So I've got all these triples, but the left can extension isn't just this collection of triples. I have to identify some of them. When do I identify some of them? Well, I, if I have two triples, I identify them if, there is an H that takes the first element, the, the type A to the type A prime. So the first components are um, related by H. The second components, F and F prime, are um, related as in this diagram. And the third components are related by saying that um, this Y prime is F, capital F, this one, this one, f of h of y. So that's what I've written here. And I'm not just saying that two triples are related um, if there is such an h. I have to take the smallest equivalence relation that's generated by this condition. OK, so that seems, to, le to me at least, it seems really complicated. But we're in the discrete setting because we're kind of warming up in the discrete setting. So we're in the discrete setting and things here are, are relatively simple, right? Because the only morphisms I have are identity morphisms. So this H has to be an identity morphism. Applying K to an identity gives me an identity, right? Because K is a functor. So I'm really saying that um, H has to be an identity. F has to be an identity. F prime has to be an identity. So that means that if I have two um, triples, they're going to be related exactly when A is equal to A prime, when F is an identity and F prime is an identity, and when Y is equal to Y prime. So this crazy union modded out by some equivalence relation is just going to turn into a union, but I'm going to note that this F has to um, 
identify K, A, and X, right? Because the only morphisms I have are exactly identities. So this, um, this union mod some equivalence relation is just going to turn into this union. So in other words, what this says is that if X is K, A, right? Then this union is just all the Ys of type F, A, where A is one of my special small support sets. So in this case, it's just um, some type. Okay, so this is again the discrete setting where everything is kind of collapses in some sense because the only morphisms I have are identities. So what we know, if you think back to the GADT, um, which is this one, if I'm thinking about this GADT, if you give me something of, F, of type FA, I can apply C to it and get something of type G of KA. So I already know that the GADT syntax says that. So you give me a Y of type FA and I can apply C to it and get a G of KA. But what this tells me is that every single thing in um, every single thing in the interpretation of the GADT can be gotten in this way. Okay, so this last bullet point that you can see right now clearly says, well, you know, if I have a Y of type FA, I can apply C to it and get something in G of KA. But the fact that these things are equal here is telling me that every single um, piece of data can be gotten that way. And if X is not KA, I don't have any inhabitants of that particular instance of the GADT. So that's what I'm saying here. So um, every piece of data in the interpretation of the GADT can be described by syntax. And um, in particular, if I don't have a GAD, if I don't have um, something like an instance of G of, of the form KA, if this was just like G of X for an arbitrary X, it would be uninhabited. I wouldn't be able to make a piece of data of that type. So I can only make data of type G of K of A. Okay. So the upshot is the discrete GADT interpretations contain exactly the data that you get from the syntax. Okay, that's interesting. Um, but what about the non-discrete GADTs, right? Like what if you don't want to just say the only morphisms I have are identities if you want to work in a category that's a little bit richer, like, like we did with ADTs, or like I wanna be able to map functions. And if I just map identities, well, I know what that is. That's just gonna be an identity. But what if I wanna you know, be able to map other kinds of functions? Well, things get a little more complicated. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide if that's okay. Okay. No questions in the chat. Okay. All right. So what I've said before, sorry, you said no questions, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, what we had on this slide, it works, right? It, it clearly works. But if I want thinking about semantics of ADTs and nested types, I don't have to think about discrete categories, right? That, like I said, that's a little bit weird. The maps just the map in a discrete category is just identity. That's the only, it's the only thing it can be. It's the only morphism I even have. So it seems that something's a little bit weird. I mean, like at the least, at the very least you could say, well, I have this GADTs and their GADT stands for generalized algebraic data type. And now I'm saying that semantically a GADT doesn't really generalize an ADT. So, you know, what gives, like what's happening here? So the question I think on the table is can we see GADTs as fixed points of non-discrete functors? In other words, can we see GADTs as data types in like that normal containery mm -hmm. sense um, with like actual real, you know, bona fide proper map functions, just like we did with um, ADTs and nested types? So to answer this, we're going to look at computing um, these left can extensions in categories where you have additional normal uh, morphisms other than ID. So just as before, the left can extension can be computed as um, a co-limit. And just as before, that co-limit in set um, is a union modded out by some equivalence relation. And I even have the same diagram. 
But the difference here is that now H doesn't have to be an identity morphism and F and F prime don't have to be identity morphisms. So I can have um, some of my uh, triples actually be related in the smallest equivalence relation generated by this condition. And I don't know about you, I don't know how you feel, but that for me is really hard to think about, right? So, um, but that's what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of try to think about this condition a little bit. So in order to ensure that um, the interpretation of G is functorial, I'm gonna just as before, like with ADTs and nested types, I'm gonna need some kind of sort of strict positivity requirements. And um, for now, if it helps you, you can just think about kind of polynomial-ish functors. You could think of K as being polynomial and you could think of this F as being kind of polynomial. They don't have to be exactly that, but you, we're not trying to think of like the most robust class of GADTs that we can <clears throat> um, give semantics this way, but you can think about that if it helps. But one thing I definitely want is I don't have like truly nested GADTs. So in other words, I'm not gonna have like a sequence of sequences, either in the return type of a constructor or in the domain. Okay, um, and there are some good reasons for that that will come up in lecture four. So we'll just have that restriction. So if F and K are higher order functors, then of course the LAN is two. And again, we've already said that um, in that case, G is interpreted as the least fixed point of this functor where K doesn't have any Js, F might. And the um, this G might, um, it's a functor, so it should have a map, okay? So every time I have a triple like this, where I actually wrote the types this time, every time I have a triple like this, um, I can apply, so we can see if we can do the type checking um, verbally. So if I look at Y and it has type FA, and I have the constructor, the interpretation of the constructor for the GADT, um, if I apply C to Y, I should get something of type G of K of A. And if I map F that takes K, K of A to X down G, I mean, using, using the map for G, then what I end up with should have type G of X. So notice that I've gotten a G of, I've gotten an element of type G of X for any, any X, any instance X, not just X's that look like K of somebody. Okay, so here I have a way again to make an element of the interpretation of the GADT at any arbitrary instance, not just instances that happen to look like K of something. Well, there's no way that that um, element can be the interpretation of something constructed from syntax, right? Because the GADT takes um, F things and it makes G of K things. And if X is not K of something, then this is something that's in the interpretation of the GADT, but it's not something that comes from syntax. So if I'm thinking about the discrete interpretation of the GADT, the syntax tells the whole story. The syntax of the GADT tells me all the data in the, um, in the GADT. If I'm thinking about, um, an interpretation of a GADT in a non-discrete setting, then I will end up with things in the interpretation of the GADT that cannot be described by the syntax of the GADT. So I think of the left-hand extension as kind of tossing in that extra stuff that you need and thereby giving you, um, you could call it a map completion or a functorial completion. So it gives you some more stuff. So the interpretation is not of the GADT is not just determined by the syntax of the GADT. So let's just see what this says about our favorite GADT seek. So remember the type of S pair said, give me a seek A and a seek B. And um, I'll give you, oops, I think I need to be here too. Um, I'll give you a seek of A cross Bs. And we said, well, we're actually gonna think of its type this way. That was from the, the previous, previous slides. And check it out, like notice that right here, I have a function that takes a, um, a cross B 
to X. And remember before when we were kind of looking at, the, um, at what would happen with the map for S pair, we said, well, what would happen if I had um, a morphism F that I wanted to map and it took um, A cross Bs to something that wasn't a pair or maybe it was a pair, but the F wasn't a pair of functions. So this kind of problematic thing that we saw way back to motivate all of this to kind of show that the um, that not every GADT um, can be seen as a functor or as a, as having a map, so as a fixed point of a higher order functor, um, that exactly that same kind of morphism is appearing right here in this co-limit. So that's not really a coincidence, right? I mean, this is exactly the kind of thing that was problematic, and now we're completing so that we can now include mapping over these kinds of morphisms. And again, what I just said before is that if I look at S pair of T1 cross T2, that's gonna be um, an S pair thing only makes um, pair instances of C. But if I map such a function over a pair, I'm gonna end up with the seek of X. And that can't be, um, it can't be an S pair of anything. And it can't, so it can't be something that's in the interpretation of a term constructed from the syntax. So it's just, I'm just saying what I said on the last slide, but now I'm saying it for the specific case of seek. Okay, so again, the properly, fun this kind of functorial interpretation of seek has data elements in it that aren't constructed from syntax. But if you were to look at what happened for, um, if you did exactly this whole um, development, if you do it for ADTs and nested types, then you won't end up adding any new stuff. So for the GADTs, because you have um, a, a functor here, you're not looking at just a variable instance of the GADT in the return type, you um, in general will end up add, having to add some um, stuff, some some data, some morphisms, you'd have to add some data, like data that looks like this, in order to get your functorial interpretation. For ADTs and nested types, you wouldn't have, if you did all of that, you wouldn't um, add any new data. And the technical reason is that if you take the left can extension of a functor along the identity, you get that functor back. Um, but also another way to see it is that, um, remember for ADTs and, uh, for ADTs and nested types, I'm, I only am ever looking at seek of you know, a variable. So here, the only functor I could have, the only K I could have would be the identity. Okay, so um, that is um, what I wanted to show you for today. So um, to kind of summarize, you have ADTs and you have nested types and you have GADTs. And syntactically, um, you're kind of relaxing the description of the types of the constructors as you, as you go from ADTs to nested types to GADTs. And with ADTs and nested types, it's not that hard to see that they're fixed points of higher order functors, which is what gives us the map functions for all of them, right? Even for ADTs, you get the maps. Um, for them, which, you know, you, you might just write down, like if someone gives you an ADT like trees or something, you'd be like, yeah, I can write down a map for that. But to know where it comes from, um, I would say really, but you might say mathematically or categorically, to know where it comes from, you have to, you'd need to be able to interpret your um, data type as a fixed point of a higher order functor. What happens with GADTs if you try to do the same thing? You run into trouble and you can kind of recover in two different ways, we can recover by um, saying, hey, I don't wanna look at, um, at GADTs as being fixed points of higher order functors over arbitrary categories. I'm gonna require my categories I'm taking my um, fixed points with respect to, to be discrete, but that doesn't give interesting maps, right? Because the maps are all identities. If you map the identity, you get the identity. Or another option is that I can look at GADTs in kind of, full categories with some maybe non-identity um, non morphisms. And then the GADTs behave differently. The interpretations are, are really different because I end up having to throw some extra data in, okay? And that's really different. 
That's really different from what happens in the ADT and nested type case. There, if you do exactly this process, you'll just recover the original ADT and you'll always recover the original nested type. But with GADTs, it's a little bit different. You do actually get um, new data elements. Okay. Or another way to say it is if I look at ADTs and nested types, there's exactly one natural semantics. If I look at GADTs, there are two, and they don't even contain the same data elements. Of course, by design, they don't contain the same morphisms, right? One is discrete, one is not. Okay, so maybe that's just an interesting factoid, but um, one question you might have is, well, what practical difference could this possibly have? And that's what I wanna talk about um, next time. So I'm not gonna um, talk about it today, but I'll talk about it next time. Um, but I'll, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at these data types through the lens of parametricity. So I'm gonna kind of try to quickly remind you or introduce you to parametricity. And you can think of parametricity as saying that, um, well, I guess if I had to give a, a, a one-line elevator pitch, I might say it means that in a polymorphic language for all really means for all. But I can also think of it as saying that I have like kind of representation independence in my programming language. Okay, so if I have modules and I interpret, um, and uh, so if I have some data types and some modules, some abstract data types, and I implement the um, operations um, that that data type supports differently, but in a like corresponding ways, I would hope that computationally I would get corresponding results when I use them. And what we're gonna do is um, see that for ADTs and nested types, that is the case. I do have this kind of uniformity property. Okay, that, that is called parametricity. But for GADTs, things get a little bit, um, things get a little bit strange. So that's what I'm gonna talk about next time. And I think um, I'll answer some questions right now if there are any, and other than that, um, that's it for today. Yeah, we do have a few questions in the chat. Okay. Um, do you want me to go ahead and read them? To you? Sure. Okay. Or, if, or you can answer them if you want. <laughs> uh, I, I tried to answer some, but I'll, I'll give you these ones. Um, somebody asked, uh, like, can we pattern match on GADTs? Um, and then someone pointed out that pattern matching is usually uh, accomplished with initial algebra semantics. Right. So if you're thinking about a, um, a discrete GADT, the answer is yes, because everything is determined by the syntax, right? But what would I do if I had a non-discrete GADT and I had something that looked like this? So this would be um, in the semantics. And so I wouldn't, um, so I have some elements of the GADT that I can't really describe by syntax. I don't know how I would pattern match there. Okay, I'll, um, I'll let Alex follow up if, if he has further questions on that. Okay. Um, somebody else asked, is there a right, a right can extension? And people said yes. And they said, what does it mean in the realm of GADTs? I have no idea. I, um, that's, we're, that's not really the, the kind of syntax that we're trying to model, right? Because there, instead of having the composition in the return type, you'd have a composition elsewhere. And that, that's not how GADT syntax looks. But yes, there is a right can extension and it's related to the left can extension. And then somebody asked in the seek example, what will it look like if we also complete the syntax? And mm -hmm. will this transfer back to ADTs nested, AD, nested ADTs? Right, so I think that's exactly what we, um, what we talked about here. So it, what it will look like in the syntax is that I have elements of the interpretation that I can't describe using the syntax. So, um, so I have the syntax of my GADT and then I can ask what it means. And for me, what it means is what does it mean categorically? What does it mean semantically? What, what does it mean mathematically? And if I think about the elements of the GADT, then I have some here like this one that I can't, C as being a constructor applied to something. So the syntax of the GADT doesn't describe it, but it's still in the GADT, or at least it's in the interpretation of the GADT. Okay, so that's kind of what it looks like is you have to throw in all these kind of map completions. And then um, if, after you did that until you were 
um, exhaust till you'd exhausted them all, or you were exhausted, maybe those are the same, then um, you would have all the elements of the GADT and there would be stuff in there that you couldn't describe in terms of the syntax. Okay, and again, um, for ADTs and nested types, if you went through that process, you would not end up throwing anything new in. So you wouldn't get any new data elements if you did this kind of completion. And the reason for that is, again, um, well, intuitively, it's because when you look at the constructors for an ADT or a nested type, you always have um, seek of a variable instance on the right-hand side. The constructors always look like that, right? That was exactly the description of, um, of a nested type, for example. But um, if you're thinking categorically, then the reason that you won't throw in any new things is that if I take this LAN, I, I take the LAN along an identity, I just get the original functor that I'm taking the, um, the LAN of. So those are two different ways to see that with ADTs and nested types, you won't end up throwing in any new, new data elements in the semantics. That was a long answer. I don't know who asked that, but did that answer it? Uh, yeah, my, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm, I can. Okay, okay, so my question is actually, so because we see that in the current situation, this map seek f of spr t1, t2 cannot be uh, like, there's no reduction back into a constructor or something. Right. So my, my question is, if I want to make it be able to reduction back to a constructor of something, does that mean I will lose all the GADT, all the special thing of GADT and make the GADT back to a ADT and nested ADT? So what I would do is um, I would, in the syntax, I would have my language and I would add a new construct to that language that is the syntactic reflection of the left can extension. So I'd have a LAN construct in my language with introduction and elimination rules that correspond to the um, that correspond to the the definition that I'm trying to go back to. That kind of correspond to this. So from this, you could imagine a left can extension construct, like a LAN construct, and you could imagine you can get um, introduction elimination rules from this, and then I would program in that extended language. So that would be a way to do it. Um, what properties that extended language has? Um, this is a good question. And this is part of what we'll talk about um, next time and the time after. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. OK, great. Thanks. I'm glad. I'm not sure how to ask this uh, <laughs> partly. And it, it might not make that much sense. But right. when we make the choice to work in this discrete category, what mm -hmm. is the like, scope of that choice? Can we still interpret, you know, like um, if I want to interpret Haskell's GADTs, um, it has pattern matching. It seems like I should make this discrete setting choice. Um, but in general, in Haskell, obviously, there are lots of morphisms between types. Um, can I still, like, how do I interpret Haskell's GADTs, including programs that use pattern matching to implement interesting morphisms between those GADTs and other types? Yeah, well, this was this is actually um, kind of kind of the question, right? So like you have ADTs, you have, some people don't program much with nested types. I mean, okay, but let's just say you have ADTs. Okay, and as you say, there are lots and lots of morphisms um, between ADTs and you'd like to be able to, you know, you'd like to be able to, um, you know, map functions over your ADTs, like all the normal stuff, have pattern matching, have, um, you know, case analysis, have, you know, have folds, all that stuff. And, you know, this is exactly where this work came from. It's like, I want to, I want to be able to do the same kinds of stuff for GADTs. How can you do that? And if you, I mean, you could, again, like you could say, I am, I want all the normal stuff for ADTs and I'm happy to have my GADTs be weird and discreet. <laughs> you could, you could make that choice. Um, but then you won't get all that stuff for your, for your GADTs. If you want all that stuff for your GADTs, you have to have the, you know, this kind of, if you want the map, like you have to have this kind of non-discrete semantics. So um, I don't know how to, how to do it um, all at one. I don't think anybody knows how to do it, how to, how to have um, initial algebra semantics for 
um, ADTs, nested types, GADTs, and have them satisfy all the normal properties that you want, like in particular, parametricity, which is gonna, um, which is this kind of representation independence thing. Like, no one knows how to do that. Right, yeah, thanks, that, that makes sense. It seems like, you know, you, you don't get map for free on- No, no that's the functoriality talking. Right, right. Um, and, and so it seems like maybe we could ask to, to give up getting map and, and fold, but still write interesting functions between, uh, or like using these GADTs. Is, right. is the discrete semantics the right way to think about that or? I mean, I think that's basically what, um, what, what you're doing if you're using GADTs in Haskell, but then um, your ADTs have a really different kind of semantics and your GADTs. And again, you might say, well, hey, I'm cool with that. You know, GADTs, they're weird. They're precisely to, um, to make sure that some of my instances aren't inhabited. So I'm totally okay with that. But then, like I said, if you wanted to have a list of sequences, list has a map, but sequence does, seek doesn't have a map. So now you can't have a map that works on lists of sequences, right? So, so something's got to give somewhere. <laughs> Thanks. That makes sense. I don't know how to have it all. I don't think any, I mean, no one does as far as I know. And if you want to give a semantics to, like, if you wanted to give a semantics to the sort of Haskell version where you're willing not to take all of this nice stuff, um, mm -hmm. is that some, like, does that just look totally different from the approach that we're taking here? Or is it the discrete? Um, I think it's a discrete, it's the discrete version, right? Because um, you're really, like, if you go back to the, let me see if I can do it. Like, if you go back to, I don't know, maybe this or, or the sequence um, example. I mean, you're really, the reason that you're using a constructor, like I, I mean, I think a, a, a GADT programmer would say, but I'm using icons precisely because I don't want, um, I don't want all the instances, right? I want to restrict the instances. That's why I have this constructor that has a return type that is restricted. And, you know, that makes sense. I think from, a, that's the discrete view. And I think that makes sense from a programming, from just a programming point of view. If you're asking how you can, you know, how do I do things? Um, I, th I think that's a perfectly fine answer, but I like to ask the question why, like, or, you know, or what, like, what, what do these things mean? I can write down the syntax, but what does it mean? And how is this a data type? Is it a data type kind of like in the sense that ADTs and nested types are data types, or is it a data type in some other sense? And I think what we're seeing here is that they're, not really, a, I mean, GADTs aren't really a data type in the same sense that an ADT is a data type. Or you have to do some work to, to see it that way, but then you kind of get out of the realm of what you can um, talk about in, in, in syntax. So, you know, in what sense do GADTs generalize algebraic data types? Not clear to me. Thank you. Yeah. So like we're into philosophy now, right? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh -huh. All right, so is that it? Uh, there are a couple more questions in the chat. Okay. Um, somebody asked, can we add a constructor for the map, the map elements? Can you add a constructor for the map elements? I mean, I suppose you could, you mean like in your data type here, just have a map thing. I suppose you could, but then it's a different data type. Okay, but uh, I wonder then, uh, where these get uh, get to uh, get added to the to the type? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. to, to, in order to to make this this semantics, we transformed our type. So I wonder whether we shouldn't also add those extra objects there. To okay. Match. So, so what I would do, like I said, um, I don't know. I hope this is answering answering your question or at least discussing it. So what I would do is I would add, um, you know, this kind of LAN construct in my language that is inspired by the categorical LAN. And then in my term calculus, I would have, um, I would have some um, map terms. So I wouldn't, I would have like a map primitive. So that's the way that I would try to design this. Um, and part of the reason I would try to design it that way is because um, for the nested types to, to do the kind to get the kinds of computational properties 
of the model that um, that uh, that I think we generally want, like to have this parametricity property, um, to make a parametric model for nested types. That's exactly what we did. So there's um, a paper on my webpage, and um, I think I might have even included it on my homepage um, under resources for OPLSS 2021. But if it's not there, it's in the publications page, and it's about um, parametricity for nested types. And we did exactly that, adding in the map terms, but not, um, not the land, because you don't need the land for nested types. So if I were going to try to design a calculus, then I would add in the land and I would add in the maps and then I would try to prove the properties that I wanted of the model. Um, that is actually where this work kind of started and um, turns out it's actually really hard to do that. If for some reasons that we'll talk about next time in the time after. Okay, and then somebody asked, does the factorial semantics extend to higher inductive types? Ah, um, yes. So, um, oh, for higher inductive types. Well, it extends to higher kinded types. Um, if by higher inductive types you mean something hot ish, I don't know. But it extends to higher kinded types, if that's what you mean. And yes, there again, there is a paper on my webpage um, with Andrew Polonsky that talks about that. Okay, yeah, know. they said they meant in the, the hot sense. Oh, yeah. Great question. I wish I knew when you find out, please tell me. <laughs> okay. Anything else for now? All right. I so don't, like I, I don't see anything else in the chat. Okay. Yeah, everyone's probably gone off. So um, yeah, we'll just um, look at these um, data types through the lens of parametricity next time and see what we can say there. And I'll try to remind you what that is. <laughs>